Dr. Russell Gerlach, who is a professor of geography at Southwest Missouri State University. Sorry. Russ has been out at SMS for 10 or 11 years. Many of you will remember he talked to us a couple of years ago, reporting on his year's stay in England after he spent a year as a, on a Fulbright Exchange program in, in England. He's shortly taking off for a year in Northern Ireland. If he remembers to wear his bulletproof underwear, we may be able to uh, have him uh, tell us what's happening in Northern Ireland when he gets back. Uh, Russell is a Nebraska, Nebraska boy, born in Lincoln, uh, received all of his uh, graduate, all of his degrees from uh, Lincoln, his bac baccalaureate, master's, and doctoral degree from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. His longtime special scholarly interest has uh, been in the study of the Ozarks. Russ has traveled around the Ozarks, he has watched, he has listened, he has uh, done all kinds of things. He's written a good deal. He's written primarily about the early settlement of the Ozarks area. In 1976, he published a book called Immigrants in the Ozarks. I would planned to hold it aloft and wave it so you could see it, maybe go out and buy it, but uh, my complimentary copy hasn't arrived yet through the campus mail. So uh, I've been waiting for that. And, uh, it's quite expensive. You, you may want to borrow mine when it comes out, rather than going out and buying your own. Uh, Russ is presently working on a project directing a rather sizable grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, in which he and a half a dozen other people are preparing curricular materials, and will be bringing in and working with public school teachers uh, to help incorporate material about the Ozarks in the uh, public school curricula. Uh, today he's going to talk with us about one of the more serious aspects of his studies of the Ozarks over many years, moonshining in the Ozarks, uh, with uh, many details and testimonies of experiences regarding moonshining. Uh, as Russ begins, I'm going to be getting his uh, umbilical cord over here to work the projectors. Don't mind my uh, working among you here. Russ, good to have you. Do what you want here. Lloyd, my book is now on sale for <laughs> half price. <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit about moonshining. Uh, an incident, and I can't use names, just the other day, one of the people working in the grant we have this summer went down to a, a place in the Ozarks to record some traditional musicians. Everything was going fine until a neighbor stopped by and happened to bring his jug with them and the recording session deteriorated and he's going back next Monday and try again. So there is still some illegal alcohol available in the Ozarks. It is largely a thing of the past. Now the program I'll show today tries to put it in perspective. It's been romanticized as part of our legendary Ozark past. There's, there, there is a folky part to it and there's also a very serious and tragic aspect to moonshining. And I'll try to put it in some kind of perspective. Uh, go ahead and kill the lights. Uh, incidentally, the pictures I'll show were, uh, were got from uh, agents. Some are black and white. Uh, agents take pictures of stills when they seize them. Some agents take black and white pictures. Some take color pictures. Some I took myself. I have never visited an active working still. I would have great reservations about doing that because I would be witnessing the commission of a felony and uh, that would be an uncomfortable situation to be in. But if you're walking, now these are very distant for me, I need my glasses to see them, but if you were walking out in the woods, particularly in North Arkansas more than uh, Missouri, because Arkansas has so many dry counties, you might see a scene like that. That is a still. An agent happened to be walking by, saw that. Now it's not assembled. And when a moonshiner is not producing, he will often disassemble the still, remove one major component. The reason he does that is if the still is found, then it's a misdemeanor because it's not a working still. So he takes one, usually the cap, puts it in a very different location so uh, all the components are not together. It is a felony and, and the penalties are rather extreme. But that might be, and I've stumbled across components of stills in southwest Missouri on several occasions. None appeared to have been active in very recent times, but it is part of our folk culture, and this is a model of a still over in, on the Blue Ridge Parkway. Uh, many of you have seen this one. It's down Shepherd of the Hills, uh, portraying this aspect of our past. 
Uh, there was so much interest shown in moonshining at Alley Springs that they resurrected this gentleman, Art Patterson, to operate a still. I'm half convinced, now Art is not with the Park Service any longer, after talking with Art, that Art never was much of a moonshiner. His technique would not produce very good whiskey. Art has since left the Park Service and has been replaced by another individual, but they do make moonshine four days a week at LA Springs and then dump it out. Uh, his boss at the time I was up there was named Alex Outlaw, who was the director of the Scenic Riverways. Uh, the, the distillation comes to us from Ireland, and the Scotch and the Irish still argue as to, to whose term it is, who invented whiskey making. The term whiskey means water of life in Gaelic. This is a map which you probably can't read, but the dark circles show all the illicit stills seized in Ireland, which at that time included Northern Ireland, most up in the, the northern two-thirds of Ireland. So it is a, a practice brought to this country by the Irish, the Scotch-Irish, and the Scottish, who were all very active in whiskey making. And this is a picture of an Irish still, which is a little dark, uh, appropriately tinted green. They still have a tremendous amount of moonshining in Ireland. It's nonviolent. Our moonshining is, is associated with very violent behavior. If you're an Irish moonshiner and you're caught, you just throw in the towel and go do your time. Uh, in this country, there's a tendency to, to resist, but it is uh, there, it's strictly to avoid the tax. Uh, you could not have a dry county in Ireland. It uh, just simply wouldn't work. Here's one of our early famous uh, distillers in America. That's, of course, Mount Vernon. George Washington had a still, but back then it wasn't illegal. The problem with whiskey has been that the government at various times has looked around for ways to pay debts that the country's accumulated, and they fall back on whiskey. Uh, every once in a while, the settlers would protest the Whiskey Rebellion in 1494. That's what led many of the Scotch-Irish to move down the Great Valley into the uh, Southern Highlands, was uh, their reluctance to pay tax on their whiskey uh, in Pennsylvania. But George had his still, but it wasn't illegal back then. I uh, got serious about this a few years ago and got a little grant and went back to Washington. And I was going to make, I'm a geographer, so I was going to make a map of all the stills in the Ozarks. And I knew exactly what I wanted. They're little three by five cards that they file all this information on. And I tried to use the Freedom of Information Act to get the cards, and they used the Freedom of Information Act to deny me the cards. But they ran me around that building for three days. I finally gave, they finally concluded that I could have the information, but it was probably in the Federal Records Center in St. Louis. It was probably in the area that was burned, and they could tell me in five or six years uh, whether that information existed at all. Anyway, they did make it very, very difficult for me to get the information I wanted, but I had a good time in Washington anyway. Uh, the, the government has been, been very, very active in, in regulating the production and uh, distribution of alcohol in these. This is from the Treasury Department's little museum back there. One of the more interesting stories, there's one on the right says, Hello, sucker, warning about the evils of moonshine. One effort to get to the consumers in the Appalachians, realizing that the children could read the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, which is the agency that controls uh, liquor, sent home rulers with the children that, that had warnings about moonshining <coughs> on them, trying to get to the parents uh, through their children. But they have tried, uh, tried various ways of doing this. There's also the tax problem. Now, that's a bonded whiskey warehouse over at uh, Bardstown, Kentucky. There is a tremendous tax uh, bite on, on alcohol, and of course moonshiners pay none of that. One of the major opponents of illicit distillation is the licensed beverage industry because every jug of moonshine sold uh, is a bottle of whiskey they can't sell. And although contrary to the image, uh, the rural image of moonshining, the major markets for moonshine today are in black ghettos of large southern cities, uh, cities like New Orleans and Atlanta and Birmingham. That is where most of it is sold, and that does deny the licensed beverage industry access to a rather substantial market. But anyway, there's a long story that goes behind you. Uh, how carefully the federal government controls uh, distilled spirits until you pay the tax on them. All the keys are held by federal agents. You don't even have access to your own product as it's aging. You must get the key from an agent to go in your warehouse. There are 12 agents uh, stationed at that very small distillery. This is a diagram of a still. I'll, I'll 
show you each each phase of the operation. I'm not a chemist, but I have talked to chemists about this, about the operation. I think I could do it uh, if, if I tried. I would not try. I don't like the stuff to start with, and uh, I, I'm quite content uh, with my position as it is. Uh, but I think I could do it uh, if I think I know enough about it now. But anyway, you, you start out. Uh, uh, if, if you want to see stills, uh, this is the uh, Museum of Whiskey History. We, we must have a museum in this country to commemorate every conceivable thing. This one is at a uh, little distillery in Kentucky. You can go in, they have a still on loan from the federal government. Uh, that is a real bona fide uh, still. This is more what you'd see. This is a still in North Arkansas. They don't look quite so clean out in the country. Uh, cruddy looking. I'll explain the individual components in, in a moment. But that is what you might run across out uh, in the country. Most of the stills will be located on some kind of public land, uh, federal forest land preferably, because there is a provision in the uh, alcohol laws that if you are caught moonshining on your property, your property also goes to the federal government. If you're caught carrying moonshine in a car, the car becomes a property of the federal government. So there is a tendency to locate stills on public property. And there was an article a few years ago about the number of forest fires that relate to illicit distillation on federal forest land. Now you start out with Nash. This is just a picturesque uh, setting. This is in North Arkansas, and I could give you the county and actual location of all of these. That's called Winterset Mash. Well, there are barrels inside. Now they are metal. Uh, old traditional moonshiners would never use metal barrels because there is a reaction with the, the ethanol as it's uh, developing. They would use wooden barrels, but woods, wooden barrels are expensive, hard to come by, so uh, metal drums that may have had oil, some chemical. Bear in mind, many of these people are illiterate, and if there were some warning on the barrel, they couldn't read it. Uh, they, they pack material around the barrels and then build that little log crib, and then put 40, 40, 40 uh, components of water, sugar, corn, and then some yeast in there, and let it uh, ferment for about a week. Uh, they can tell exactly how the process is going, but that's kind of a traditional setting. Here's one uh, using fiberglass, and I presume some, something like that. Some of the fibers might get in the, uh, the alcohol. And one, one thing you have to think about if you ever want to drink this stuff is FDA isn't out there looking at it. It is a totally unregulated industry. I, I can show you uh, substantiated references to moonshiners putting everything from cow manure to lye uh, to, to other things in uh, whiskey. To, they, the fellow who put the manure in thought it made it taste a little better. Lye is supposed to speed up the fermentation process. So you are drinking a product that is, is totally unregulated. Anyway, this, these again are the, uh, the barrels. You, you put the 40-40-40 in the water, corn, uh, or any grain. You can, you can ferment garbage, as a matter of fact. That has been done as well. Uh, the corn will rise to the top. When the corn drops back down, then it's ready. You've got about 7% alcohol. Uh, and here is looking at, it's a milky looking liquid, has a very distinctive odor. When you get to about 7% alcohol, that's as far as you're going to go. If you let it go any farther, it turns sour on you. Then you dish it out, put it in a cooker. Now this is a traditional copper pot. It's a pressure cooker. Uh, made from copper. Copper is a preferred metal because there is no reaction between the ethanol and the copper. You dish it into the cooker, fire the cooker up, seal the cooker to start with. Uh, normally with uh, some kind of cap, but maybe a bolt-on cap, you may just use weight to hold the cap on. Uh, fire the cooker up, heat it up to about 175 degrees because that's the approximate boiling point, 173.8 actually, boiling point of ethanol, which is drinking alcohol. You want the alcohol vapors to come off and the water to stay behind. Uh, the alcohol vapors will rise and go down a tube and then there. Normally there will be a middle operation called a thumper, various purifying operations uh, in the middle, but eventually you're trying to get it over to a, a condenser and uh, liquefy it and that's your product. But this is a, a traditional copper pot, a fairly large one down in Benford, Arkansas. This one was seized, and I could give you the dates on all of these, 75 was when this one was seized. Uh, this is a what's called a mailbox still because of its shape. This is a larger commercial operation. Again, everything copper. This, this is probably a pretty good product. Prob the, the operator appears to know what he's doing. 
And here's one, again, a mailbox still made from an old 55 gallon drum saw in half. Probably not a very good uh, product. But this one is, is very folky in that he has a hand pump over there for water uh, to cool the condenser. And here's kind of the stovetop variety that was popular back during the Prohibition uh, era. Here's one they, they resurrected down at School of the Ozarks. Uh, now, it did not have the wooden legs when it was distilled, but it's a cream separator that was used as a distillery uh, some years ago. It's now sitting back in one of their garages. They may eventually put it on display. But still, it's coming in all different sizes and shapes. Uh, now, the, the fuel to cook, cook with used to be wood, and a good moonshiner can, can just look at his still and tell the temperature of the mash. Uh, the old timers are gone. Now, this happened to be a rather, this one they caught in operation, again, in North Arkansas, and you can still see the, uh, uh, the burning logs on the left-hand side. This was a two-part still. It had a cooker on the left and a cooker on the right, and one condenser unit in the middle. This was a fairly good size still. But wood is, is hard to handle for, and there's also quite, quite a bit of smoke associated with it. Uh, you can see on the left the new fuel, uh, various kinds of uh, propane, butane uh, are the preferred fuels now because they're smokeless uh, and odorless. And this is the oddest fueled still I've ever run across. This one was fueled with an open dish of gasoline that was lit, mm -hmm. uh, producing a, a, a potential bomb. But uh, this, again, was down in all the colored ones are in North Arkansas. Anyway, once you've got the vapor coming off, going through some kind of tube, preferably copper, but it need not be copper, then you somehow get the vapors down into an area where they can be surrounded by cool water so they can be caused to condense. And if you look down at the bottom, that pipe is where the actual alcohol comes out, and you have to wonder if it's ever been cleaned. Hopefully that tin can sitting down there is not what he collects the product in. But there are, are various things used. Now, this is a shot out of the Appalachians. That's the traditional copper coil, which is not used very much anymore because copper is expensive. Uh, a copper sleeve is actually easier to handle, where you take two sheets of copper and just leave an airspace in between, and the vapors come into that airspace. But uh, when copper became expensive, many moonshiners fell upon an alternative, and that's an old auto radiator. The problem with, uh, and, and you, you get the same effect with an old auto radiator. The problem is that most radiators have been soldered at one time or another. And when alcohol and solder react chemically, they produce lead salts, and lead salts are lethal. There have been more deaths attributed to contaminated moonshine, moonshine contaminated with lead salts than any other single thing. It's because so many people use car radiators as condensers. They're available. And you aren't dealing with people who go out and read the rules and regulations. They often are very illiterate, or very, they are illiterate. They, they just simply know that Grandpa used to use one of these, and, and so they use one. And there was one case in Wichita, 33 people died from drinking one contaminated batch of moonshine. Now there's your product sitting out. Now that looks very picturesque, a nice uh, bottle. It's a clear white. Uh, white liquor. Now that looks all right, but the next one I think puts it in a little different perspective. I got this from an agent down in North Arkansas, and he told me the story that went with it. He could tell when somebody was distilling in his county by watching an old man who was kind of the subcontractor who provided the jugs. When someone went into production, this old man would go through the alleys and collect old gallon jugs, which he would then provide to the moonshiners. While he was illiterate, the chances are the moonshiners were illiterate as well. Uh, some of those jugs may well have contained very, very deadly toxic substances. Uh, you really can't be sure that the moonshiner cleaned them out, knew what they contained. So that, that's really what you're getting. Most of the time to do peel the label off. But the old jugs like that, uh, that's what, and, and in fact the general unsanitary conditions surrounding every aspect of the operation are very alarming. Uh, this shows uh, chandeliers and I can't even see what I'm trying to show. Well, anyway, if you do get caught, oh, well, these are federal agents down in North Arkansas busting a still, and they, they tend to be a, a bit hamish <coughs> about the whole thing, and they love to photograph every aspect of the operation. They come in, if it's a small still, they whack it up, because they know the recidivism rate among moonshiners approaches 90%. The fellow's going to go away for his period of time. He's going to come back. The first thing they'll do is try to find his old still. 
uh, put it back together. So you want to destroy the still to the point where it cannot be reconstructed. So if it's a small still, they'll chop it up. If it's a big one, they'll use dynamite and blow it up. But they're uh, about to destroy that still. And this is one from the Appalachians that has been uh, uh, destroyed. Uh, and I think these are just a few old historic pictures. This is a, a still raid from 1885 down in, uh, in Alabama and uh, posing with the axe and all. This is the Moonshiner section of the Atlanta City Jail in 1885. They complete with their own musician. There's a fellow with a fiddle off on the right. Uh, and, and this leads to another aspect. Many people in, in the southeastern quarter of the United States have never viewed moonshining as criminal. The fact that it has been legal, whiskey, these are in dry areas, there are approximately 400 dry counties in the United States. The fact that there are other parts of the country in which consuming alcohol is legal uh, allows them to, to, to think they're not really committing a crime. And I've had many moonshiners tell me, in, in the process, process of admitting to moonshining, pointing out that it was not really a criminal act. They weren't hurting anybody. It did put uh, bread on the table during the Depression, but there was a strong feeling that they weren't violating the law, and so there's no sense of guilt associated with this. Uh, this is uh, one I'm running a, a little late, but it's a story they went out, a friend of mine went out to bust a still in Tennessee and caught the two moonshiners, took a newspaper photographer with him, and, and the newspaper photographer was to photograph the still raid, uh, the agents busting up the still. So they handcuffed the two moonshiners, sat them down, and they proceeded to bust up the still. Well, the photographer took pictures of the two moonshiners sitting there drinking their own moonshine, watching the agents bust the still, which was a, a, a source of some embarrassment to the agents. <laughs> now, you have to hide your still, of course. Now, this is, uh, if any of you are familiar with the legendary Ozark Belladere Jimmy Driftwood, this home is about. A uh, mile and a half from Jimmy's home, and in this house they found this still. About three miles the other direction is uh, this <coughs> barn. Inside that barn they found this still. So you, you got to hide your still well. There are very, very few out in the open anymore. Most are probably in old houses, barns, chicken barns, whatever. Uh, relatively few are out in the open. Caves have never been a popular location for stills on the whole because caves have always been so well known by everyone. Too many kids played in caves. Uh, there are, are several uh, sort of forces behind the efforts to end moonshining. That's a shot of Carrie Nation. Uh, the, the strong feeling in some southeastern states that it just simply is uh, uh, immoral to drink has led uh, to, to many efforts to curb it. I'm reminded of one little story. This is in Tennessee. I was working in an area called Hancock County, it's where a very famous group of people called Melungeons live, and I was talking to a federal agent over there who busted about 6,000 stills in his 30 years, and also a sheriff who was about 80 who had busted about the same number of stills. A federal agent just happened to volunteer that in his many, many years he had pulled his gun once, fired it, and not hurt anyone. The sheriff working in the same county had shot and killed 29 moonshiners in the same period of time. It led me to wonder why the sheriff had to kill so many more. Well, it turns out the way he got elected was he was, uh, he was judge, jury, and executioner. And it, to him, it was a very moral thing. The federal agent was very professional. So if you do it and you're going to get caught, uh, let a federal agent catch you. They're very professional about it. They're simply out to end the practice where, as the local sheriffs know the recidivism rate, and they're going to rid society of a menace. Anyway, this map just shows the, the major areas where moonshining is prevalent, which is probably no uh, surprise to anyone. There are, now, you won't be able to read these statistics. Uh, the, 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 the second fact is the tax problem. This is what the government is really after at one level, is to end the big syndicated operations. They're not after some 80-year-old man who makes five gallons a year. They're after the big syndicated operations because they do represent a several hundred million dollar tax loss each year. Uh, this is an example of a syndicated still. That's an old boiler unit that's been converted to a still. Uh, this is another one, uh, big, huge units. Uh, these are a couple shots inside a house in, in Atlanta, Georgia, that was about the size of Foremost Dairy. Uh, this is their assembly line. This is their bottling area. Now, this is a still. This is not some little old man. This is a big syndicated operation. Also, the producer is not a consumer, and therefore, the quality of his product means relatively little. And he's not above uh, turning out lethal product if there's profit in it. 
Uh, and then the, the other concern of the, the agents is simply the health hazard. And these are just an assortment of articles that tell about the, uh, the evils of drinking moonshine. This is a shot at a still. These were on top of a still, indicating that those components were used in the mash, dumped in because they speeded up fermentation. The lye stays with the product. Just the unsanitary conditions, if you look inside those mash barrels, they may never have been cleaned. Uh, agents have found everything from dead rats, cats, snakes uh, that fall in. Often moonshine barrels are buried to keep the heat in, and the rat, cat, something falls in, becomes part of the product. There simply is no quality control in the industry. <laughs> now this is actual numbers of still seized. And I'll just flip past this because I doubt that you can read it. This is 72, but there are a number of states. Uh, Georgia, of course, is a major state. Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky. This is where most of the dry counties are located. If you ever wondered about dry counties, and this I'll skip past that one. If you ever wondered about dry counties and why are they dry? Uh, I heard one interpretation from an official in Mississippi that made some sense. It's not as simple as it sounds. He said that his county would remain dry so long as the good people could stagger to the polls and keep it that way, suggesting all the vested interests there are in maintaining dry status. All the officials who were on the take, and there are unfortunately many, the private clubs that operate in every one of these counties. Uh, it really is it's big business to stay dry. These are still seizures in Missouri. And again, I can't even read them up here. But Missouri had a lot, and then we went wet, and our number of still seizures dropped off to nothing. Much of North Arkansas has remained dry, and consequently, they have quite a bit of moonshine. The agents a few years ago when I talked to them believed that many of the stills in southwest Missouri, and they think they're around 25 or 30 small ones, are here to serve North Arkansas. We really have no need for it here. But agents aren't looking as hard in Missouri, so make it here and then ship it across into Arkansas. Incidentally, any good moonshiner also carries bonded whiskey. Uh, that's a, a map. The black areas are the dry counties in North Arkansas. I believe two have gone wet since I made that map. They will go wet if it requires that to bring the tourists in. And you can look at a number of, of areas in the United States that are traditionally dry but went wet because tourism demanded it. Uh, th this is a, a map of, of Texas that shows the association between certain religious groups and attitudes on drinking, which is probably no surprise. Baptists and Methodists, uh, largely dry areas, those light areas, at the top of the map are Baptist, Methodist, and Dry. The lower, darker colored areas are Catholic, uh, Hispanic largely, and, uh, and wet. And there is very definitely an association between religion uh, and attitudes on temperance. Uh, I wanted to show you one letter, and unfortunately I doubt that you'll be able to read it. Now you couldn't read this, but there, this is a whole other part of moonshining. This is, uh, the agents get most of their information on stills from relatives or friends, a wife who turns in her husband, because when her husband's making, he's drinking. When he's drinking, he's violent, loses his job, beats on the kids, teaches the kids how to make moonshine. This is a letter, and I, I typed it, and uh, anyway, if, if you could read through that, this is a very tragic letter from a wife uh, about her husband's moonshining activities and how the husband keeps the little boy out working on the still, won't let him go to school, he beats up his wife all the time. And th this is the real tragic side of moonshining. The, the, the way it affects families is, is devastating. I've got many, many letters like this. This one is just really poignant. And she goes ahead at the bottom there, if you can read it, and throws in the location of a couple other stills for good measure. <laughs> but this is how they get, they, they don't actually go out and track them down. Somebody comes in and writes to them, calls them, says there's a still out here, come and get it, and they go get it. And then finally, uh, I, I'd heard a lot of stories, a lot of odd stories in moonshining, but I heard one about a 700-pound lady who became the moonshine queen of the Appalachians, and that sounded like one of these tall stories. So I went over to Hancock County, and this is the Clinch River Valley, and supposedly many years ago, these people moved up on top of that ridge. It's about 4,000 feet up there. It's called Newman's Ridge. And there was a lady who was a Melungeon, and that's a, a mixed race strain that lives in this particular area of Tennessee named Aunt Mahalia Mullins, who grew to 700 pounds, and her sons made the moonshine, and she sold it, and she lived in a cabin up there. One time, the sheriff finally got fed up and sent, uh, this is a still that was seized the day I was there, uh, the agents uh, finally sent someone up to a restaurant and bring her back down. They had enough of her moonshining. She was so large, she could not be gotten through the, the door of her cabin. 
And so the sheriff, the deputy, wrote on his ticket that she was catchable but not fetchable. <laughs> this all sounds like a, a wild story. So I ran into her grandnephew who hiked me up to her cabin. The legend has it when she died, she was so large, they had to tear out a wall of the cabin and just roll her body downhill into a pre-dug grave. And he showed me the grave, which was about the size of a piano, a uh, grand piano. Showed me how they had taken the wall out, kept warning me about the, uh, the bears and the snakes and all that on the way up. And that's Huey sitting off to the left. And I finally ran into the only surviving picture of Aunt Mahalia Mullins, and uh, that is it. She was the legendary moonshine queen of the Appalachians uh, around 1890 to 1905. But I, I've read enough accounts of her since then, and I'm, I'm convinced that there's a lot of truth in it. But, uh, and then as, as just the last one, that for any of you who don't know, drinking uh, to people who I used to live serious business, that is King Gambrinus, the patron, patron saint of brewing, for any of you of German or North European extraction. Okay, Lloyd, that's, that's it. Now, I, I'm answering questions you have uh, about this. What's a gallon of moonshine cost, Russell? Around here right now? Mm -hmm. I can find out for you this afternoon. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't drink this stuff. All no, I <laughs> For your car. For my car, yeah. Yes, all. Yes. What proof is it that most of that compared to our regular whiskey by the county? Okay, if you want to, now it depends on how you run your operation. You can turn out uh, about 95%, which is 180 proof, if you double it. Now, the longer you run, the lower it goes. Now, most of the stuff turned out of a still that has the middle thumper operation, which is a, where you, the, the vapors go down into more mash and come back out. That'll run initially about 92%, 184 proof. Uh, and you, you, you can run a pretty good sized batch and never get below 50% alcohol. So most good moonshiners run it through twice and then cut it. They would prefer to keep it at a very, very high alcohol percent and then cut it. And so they are capable, a, a traditional still is capable of turning out alcohol at a high enough percentage to run an automobile on. A traditional still can run about 95% if you're very careful about all aspects of the operation. Yes? The cost to you as a consumer? Right. I haven't bought any recently. I don't know. It uh, moonshiners. Uh, in in the articles I've read about the commercial stuff going into the ghettos of uh, uh, New Orleans and Atlanta and places like that, they can undersell bonded whiskey by about twenty percent and still realize a three hundred percent profit. I mean, that, that, that's the big business today. It's, it's not the hill people. Uh, not, I'm told you can go down to Jasper, Arkansas, and all those old men sitting around the square are either moonshiners or at least agents for moonshiners. The problem is you can't walk up to them and buy it. Because the less you look like a federal agent, the more they think you are. So there is some available down here. I don't think it's that much. 